So right before I started to shoot my video that I put up yesterday, it occurred to me that this month, October 2024, marks my 40th year as a professional DJ. Kind of forgotten about it, but there it was. I thought maybe it was worth a video because I mentioned it on social media, kind of in a tongue-in-cheek way. Hey, I've been a DJ for 40 years. I probably don't want to tell all my clients this because it sounds like you're old when you do that. Even if you are old, but you're trying to not look so old. <laughs> anyway, got a lot of comments on that post. And some people have talked about, well, I retired because of the music or because of this or because of that. It got me thinking, you know, how did I manage to stay in this? And how do I manage to stay in this after 40 years? I want to talk about that a little bit in this video. This video might have a few different parts to it. There will be a point to it at the end. But I thought it would be fun to start the video to really kind of give you the whole story as to how I started doing this DJ thing in the first place. And Wham! is to blame. 100%. It's Wham's fault. Particularly this album. Let me explain. So, when I started junior high school, we were getting ready to have our first school dance, and I was really excited about it. And I got all dressed up the day of the dance. And long story short, without getting into too much detail, I got in an altercation and I cracked somebody's ribs. I didn't mean to. It was an accident. I really didn't mean to. I was just messing around and it happened. Well, I got in trouble for that. And part of that was being ejected from the dance. What I did every Friday and Saturday was walk to the skating rink. It was my jam. Love going skating. Some people like sports and stuff. I was more into motorcycles, bicycles, and skating. Skating was great because it was social. You could hear music. There was lights. It was the closest thing I could get to going to a club when I was a preteen, teen, whatever. I was pretty good at it. So I get kicked out of the dance. Oh, crap. Okay, this sucks. I go to my locker to get my skates. And I'm walking past the gym, and I see all these cute girls dancing to this brand new song, Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. And my heart just sunk. I mean, I could hear the sad piano music, you know, almost, in, in, the, in the background. So I walk to the skating rink, and I get there early. Of course, they all know me down there. Uh, husband and wife owned it. The wife was at the skate counter picking songs out of the Columbia House Record and Tape Club flyer as you buy you get 12 free if you buy four more in the next i don't know 10 years or whatever it was she could tell i was bummed out so she let me pick some songs i'd done it before with her and i remember seeing this and thinking to myself wow those cute girls are really going strong dancing to this at the dance that i'm not able to go to like you should get that one it's a good one Fast forward to probably, I don't know, six weeks later, whatever brought us to in October. I was in line to go skating. I was there very early after school, walked down there. And the DJs who were supposed to be there that night weren't going to be coming in. So they asked me to do it. I said, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't worry about it. I'll have my 10-year-old daughter show you everything in that DJ booth. And she did. She showed me the mixing board and the turntables and the light switches where the records were. There were a lot of records there that I had picked out that I never heard. The DJs never played them. Now, as a person who went skating, kind of subconsciously, I was always thinking about what I would do different if I were DJing, what music I would play that was different, what I would say that was different than what the regular guys were saying. There were two guys who were kind of a team and they were kind of rough, tough guys, a little older than me. And there was one other guy who was older. Oh, I say older. He I think he was 19. He drove a Camaro, whatever. The rest of us were just teenagers, young teenagers. One thing that the guys always said on the microphone was when it came time to couple skate, hey, it's time for a couples only. If you're not skating with a couple, please leave the floor. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't make sense. If I'm skating with a couple, there are three people. So if you're not skating with a partner, please leave the floor. A lot of girls skated together back then. That was fine. 
I'm, I'm not judging anybody here. Never did, never will. So I changed that. That was something that I said that was different. And I was able to play all these songs that I already handpicked for the place. They had their tracks that they played. And some of it I liked. Some of it I didn't care for. And I felt like other things needed to be played. So Wham! was one of those things. The first song I ever played was not Wham! However, this might have been the second. I might have put Wake Me Up Before You Go Go on as the second song. I don't remember. But the first song that I played was actually Joe Walsh, The Confessor. The album was there. The older DJ had it. He left it there. I played it. If you don't know the track, check it out. It's... Not a dance track or whatever. It kind of starts off slow and ends very hard and cold. It's an interesting song. Anyway, Wham is to blame. She's like, hey, you can already pick the music. You've already picked a lot of the music up there. Now, go play it. What else was in that booth? I got a collection of stuff here. Madonna, first album. They didn't play it much. I played the hell out of it. Holiday, Lucky Star, Borderline, great tracks. This one, too. Like a Virgin was hot. I'd like to dress you up a little later on. Angel, Material Girl. Tons of great songs on this one that I was able to play. Um, this, Purple Rain soundtrack, of course. You could put a side on and go do something else for a while and just let it play. It was It's a good album front to back. And if you're cool, like we were, we had Let's Go Crazy with the flip side of Erotic City, which was a fun one to play at the Late Night Skate. By the way, every album that I'm going to show you, these are albums that they already had there. In fact, everywhere I worked for the first 10 years of my career had a music library. All I did was bring in a supplemental record here and there that I thought would be cool, kind of a signature track. And I got a few of those in here. One in particular that I used to bring in, I'll, I'll show you. But Prince 1999 was still hot. Again, you could put a side on and walk away. Le Ray Corvette, 1999. I love Delirious. Let's Pretend We're Married. Those are big ones. And that's pretty much side one, I think, or album one or something. Even Dance Music Sex Romance, DMSR, was a cool one to play. Yeah, we had Thriller and... You had to have Thriller, and you played Beat It, and Billie Jean, and Want to Be Starting Something, and all that stuff. Of course. Of course. This was mine. In fact, funny thing about this one, Rat Out of the Cellar. <laughs> I had a concert t-shirt. I had gone to see Rat at the Dane County Coliseum, and I had a t-shirt. It was like 10 bucks to get in. Un unbelievable. The autograph opened for them. Turn up the radio. Anyway, I think I wore my Rat and roll concert t-shirt every night that I worked for probably six months until somebody said, hey, do you only have one shirt? Oh my gosh. It was just the wash cycle, you know? To this day, I grab what's on top of the wash, whatever Blanca folds and puts away, what's on top, that's what I wear. Same thing when I was a kid. Whatever mom washed and put away, what was, what was on top, that's what I wore. So Friday, I wore the rat shirt. <laughs> but this was a good album. This, this was a good front to back album too that you could put on. This was mine. I brought this one in. Motley Crue, Shout Out the Devil. In fact, this exact copy. I loved that album. Looks to Kill was really cool. This next song. This I love playing this track. This is Murray Head, One Night in Bangkok. So I'll tell you a story. One of my friends, that's still my friend to this day, uh, his name is Dave Bach. And he's about three years older than I am, I guess. So... He was one of my friends that was driving a car and getting into clubs and stuff, you know, well before I was. Uh, went to college when I started, like, my freshman year of high school, so I got the college experience going to his dorm. Just a cool guy. He just kind of took me on as, as his little brother, and he's absolutely insane, but he's a good dude. So anyway, One Night in Bangkok, Murray Head, I love the track, but I used to change the lyrics to One Night with Dave Bach, and I would sing this over the microphone just to tease Dave. He was there all the time. He went to a, a Catholic seminary. And on weekends, they would bring the kids on a bus to go skating, kind of a recreational thing. He was in the dorms at the Catholic Seminary, and he, he did not become a priest, by the way. Far from it. But his parents lived just a few blocks away from the seminary, so he was able to go home and get the family car and do things. And, and he, he, oh, Dave, Dave was a, a great guy, and he is still a great guy. I love you, Dave. This was my record. Art of Noise, Who's Afraid Of? This is something that they never played or never even asked to play. 
This is beatbox. This is close to the edit and moments in love for the Quiet Storm slow gems that I play sometimes. All right, I got to put my glasses on because the picture sleeves are few and far between from here on out. What do we got? Ah, Dad's Band Joystick. Played that one a lot. Uh, Dougie Fresh. Both The Show and La Di Da. Uh, both of those tracks. This was a big one. Hard Times, Run DMC. The guys played this more than I did. They played a lot of Houdini, and I didn't play a lot of Houdini. Although, I really liked Five Minutes of Funk. I liked Friends, but they, they would go Houdini crazy. And they were also really big on the Beat Street soundtrack. And, and not the great songs on the Beat Street soundtrack, like Beat Street Breakdown. I never thought that was a great track, but they used to play the hell out of it. I didn't, but I did throw Hard Times on it. I like that one. Nucleus, jam on it. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know. Of course. Laid Back White Horse. Absolutely. 100%. This album was great. Those DJs, as much as we didn't get along, because we really didn't get along, they turned me onto this, and I'm so glad that they did. LA Dream Team, Kings of the West Coast. This is a fantastic early electro album. It's really good. There was a time when electro and rap were oftentimes the same thing rap wasn't so much a genre as, as it was something you did in like an electro song run dmc was different but yeah most of it was was just kind of dance music this is a great album great great album if you see this on a crate dig grab it check it out there's a lot of really good songs on here rob Gray jam is absolutely incredible uh, there's there's tons of of great songs on here um nursery rhymes is good hollywood boulevard we used to play that a lot and the orchestra plays it's really good it's, it's just a great album okay here we go i can never say this 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 hashim i can never say what this is al nafish perhaps the soul it got played a lot it's just a hashim record because i couldn't say it okay this was hot this was really hot freestyle don't stop the rock this is a hot track and this stuff, a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you, the Dougie Fresh, this, LA Dream Team, was kind of underground stuff. You weren't really hearing this on the radio where we lived. This was stuff that, it was like the early electro freestyle, what we called Latin hip hop, the early days of it. Good stuff. Um, here's Don't Stop the Rock. What, what was that one? Is that, the party has just begun probably. No, it's also Don't Stop the Rock. I got two copies of Don't Stop the Rock here. That's ridiculous. And then, of course, we have, um, it's automatic. That got played a lot. Egyptian Lover. Egypt, Egypt, yeah, please. Twilight 22. Of course, Electric Kingdom. Yeah. A lot of the early electric, electro stuff. Um, Soul Sonic Force, Africa Mavada, Planet Rock. Mm-hmm. A lot. And I just brought this out for your good and pleasure. It's the back of the African Mabata uh, Frantic Situation 12-inch, which Beat Street, and yeah, this is a used record, and some other DJ wrote all over it. I don't have the Beat Street soundtrack, but I didn't play it a lot anyway. But it was it was in that crate at the skating rink. Early, early Debbie Dab, Lookout Weekend. This is kind of where it all started with the freestyle stuff. And... Um, this one, When I Hear Music, yeah. Those are just some of the records that were in that first crate and that first collection that I played out of as a DJ. You know, a few of them were mine, the Motley Crue one, the Rat one, and the um, Art of Noise. That was my stuff, but the rest of the stuff was just what was there and, and got played. But yeah, it was a matter of kind of thinking about what, the other DJs did and what I liked about what they did, what I didn't like about what they did and how I would change it. That's kind of the philosophy that I've ran with for the past 40 years. I'm not competitive. I'm not looking to be better than the next DJ. I want to be different than the next DJ. I want to be uniquely me. And that still serves me well today. Prince's Bat Dance was my next big lesson. When you're DJing at a skating rink, 
People are going to skate no matter what you play. Yeah, there are songs that you can play that will make them skate faster or pack the skate floor. Like, oh, it's a great song. I'm going to skate to it. So they'll all go out there. But no matter what you play, you, you could play taps and somebody would still be skating because they're there to skate. It's a little different when you're teaching a dance. You got to play music they're going to dance to. They're going to respond well to. When I started doing wedding receptions, I was 17 years old. The first time I went out was with a guy named Johnny Rock, and he was good. Johnny was cool. It was a wedding reception. I was an assistant DJ. And because I'd worked at the skating rink, I knew how to work turntables and mixing boards and all that stuff. So technically, I was pretty good. He was programming the night and talking on the microphone. So he would give me the records to play and he would do all the talking. And I don't know, it was probably hour left of the night. Things were going pretty strong. He says, okay, you're doing pretty good. Why don't you pick a song and play it? Back then, the multi-op that I worked for had an office person that would go out every week and buy the number one single in the country. And that particular week, it was Prince's Bat Dance. Yeah, this hit number one, believe it or not. So it was brand new, fresh in the library. I'm a big Prince fan. I love this track. I think it's cool. So I throw it on. Thinking, hey, man, I'm going to blow the roof off this place. I'm the young guy who knows what's cool, right? I put the song on, and it clears the dance floor. And they all look at me like I'm insane. It's like, Johnny, what do we do? He says, oh, don't worry about it. So he throws on something like Old Time Rock and Roll or Paradise with a Dashboard Light or Peppermint Twist. I don't know what the hell it was. And they all came back. It's like, wow, you know, maybe it's not about what I think is cool. Maybe it's really about what is going to motivate the audience in front of me. And I may not always know what that is intuitively. I may have to pay real close attention. So I started playing real close attention to what people responded to and what my... DJs who I was going out with were playing and, and I was thinking about you know, what they were doing and of course I'm always thinking about what I could do a little different but man what an education I got from those first few years working as a mobile DJ. Now a few weeks later maybe months later I don't remember another single pops up in the library and I hate it it's terrible. I'm like, why did they waste money on this? No one's ever going to dance to this. No one's going to like it. This is a waste of money. We could have gotten anything else. We could have got something cool, but we got this. And I didn't want to play it. I started getting requested, and I started playing it, and people liked it, and it was B-52's Love Shack. That's when I knew that, yeah... I felt like I had an instinct for what people like, but I didn't always have it. I had to pay attention. I had to have empathy for my audience. I had to listen to my audience. Of course, I'm going to play things that they dig, but I'm not always going to hit it. I'm not always going to intuitively know they're going to love a track unless I ask them. There's another milestone for you. One of my first bar gigs, I was 18 years old, and it was at a Best Western Executive in. They had a lounge and they had a DJ in there, I think six nights a week. So I was doing really well at the multi-op. If there was nothing going on mobile that weekend, I would work at this lounge. If I had a mobile, I would work during the week at the lounge. So I always had four or five nights in. And I was making pretty good cash. But I was 18 years old and people in this lounge were at least 21, but most of them were much older than that. And I had no idea what to play for them. Like, I didn't know. I'm clueless on this. So I got an idea. I walked up to the bar and I walked up to the first couple that I saw. I said, hey, my name is Brian. I'm the DJ. What would you like to hear? Oh my gosh, no one ever asked us that before. Hey, do you have some Elvis? Hey, do you have some Bob Seger? Hey, do you have some Temptations or some Smokey Robinson or whatever? That became a thing. I still do that to this day. And I did it because I was kind of in a panic. I literally didn't know what to do. But that was a big lesson for me as a DJ. Man, just, just 
ask people, have empathy. If you don't know, ask, right? Yeah, there's stuff that you do, of course, that they're going to dig, but you're not always going to hit it. And, and once I kind of know what people want, I have the vibe for it. And this goes for an older crowd or a younger crowd. It doesn't matter. As long as I keep that philosophy, I'm going to be relevant as a DJ. If I pay attention and have empathy for my audience and listen to them, ask them questions, be their friend, help them guide you on this journey. Yeah, you're the professional. You should be picking the songs, but a little guidance is good from your audience. Always, 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 always. It doesn't matter if they're school kids or it's a retirement party. Always get that input and have that empathy for your crowd. And I think the last thing that I'll talk about in this video might not be what you expect. There's a lot of things that happened, you know, in my career as a DJ, a lot of technology changes and a lot of club stuff happened and a lot of milestones and start my own mobile company and all this. But really the biggest game changer for me as a DJ was starting YouTube in 2007. I learned so much from all of you and not just my local market, because that's who I kind of pulled from, you know, but on a global scale, I'm learning from people in Europe and Canada, Mexico, South America, Australia, all over the place. It's really opened my eyes and, and shown me that there's so much more. We, you can never know it all. You can never know it all. And when you guys out there put videos out, I try to watch them. I mean, especially if, if you're not like this guru DJ who's got, you know, all these followers and stuff. I like to watch the videos that just the every DJ puts out. I try to be the every DJ. I'm not trying to be the superstar on my videos. I'm just showing you what I'm doing. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm just trying to be me and being straightforward and honest, you know, warts and all, mistakes and all. They're here. They're in the videos. They're they're in my suggestions sometimes. I don't always get it right, but I try to help, you know, and some of you are trying to help too or just sharing what you know and what you're doing, and, and that's what I want to see. If you've got a YouTube channel and, and you want to turn me on to something, please let me know what that YouTube channel is in the description or no, in the comment section of this video, rather. By the way, the more comments you make on these videos, the more the algorithm picks it up and more people can see these videos. So if you want to help me, leave a comment, even if it's, hey, man, I feel you or whatever. The likes and the comments are a big deal. And of course, the subscriptions are nice, but I'm really going to be pushing for those likes and comments. You got to play the game, right? I mean, you just have to. I don't want to ask anything from you, but I got to ask this from you because I, I got to play this dumb game that is the YouTube algorithm. If I could change one thing right now, what would it be? What can I improve on as a DJ today, as a 40 year vet? I know exactly what it is. And that is my local network. I need to work on that. When I was doing all the multi-ops back in the old days, I knew everybody, man. I knew all the club guys and all the mobile guys. They all knew me and they knew they could depend on me. If they got in a jam where they needed somebody to come in and be a sub or whatever, they knew I was the guy. They knew I could come in and handle whatever was thrown at me. The agents knew it. The individual multi-ops knew it. The individual DJs knew it. Everybody knew it. But most of those guys, I mean, who have been good to me over the years, are getting out of the business or are way out of the business. There are very few left. And I haven't reached out to a lot of the new talent. And I need to. I really need to reach out to this new talent, get to know them, find out what they're doing, learn from them, maybe teach them something to help them out. That's what I need to work on is that local network. I think I got the global network down. You guys are watching. No, I'm not the biggest uh, DJ YouTube channel out there, but I'm probably the oldest or one of the oldest. But that local network is so important. I got to work on that. And I think if I can do that the right way and be everybody's friend and be helpful, I think it's going to be very good for me professionally. So that's what I got to do instead of just relying on my own stuff now. I, I got to reach out and branch out and network. When I say locally, it's Milwaukee and Chicago. I got a couple people in Chicago. I do know some people in Milwaukee. I maybe am not communicating that I could use the work sometimes. They assume I'm busy and I am busy, but 
I'm not that busy as a DJ right now for mobile stuff. I'm mostly just doing the YouTube marketing stuff and, you know, the safe house occasionally. But yeah, yeah, I, I need to be more vocal about that, more honest about it and, and network in that regard. I think that would serve me well as a DJ. Some brutal honesty for me there, but yeah, that's it, man. That's my indulgent long ass video that, uh, thank you for watching, by the way. 40 more years? That'd be tough, but who knows? I think I can at least do another 20. 20 maybe? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. See how long this channel stays on the air. How long I keep posting videos. Uh, for as long as I got a pulse, I'll be doing it. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you guys so much for tuning in and being here and being part of this community. We'll see you next time. Practice and enjoy.